And with our next speaker now for this morning is Jenny Deacon, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is a senior catchment scientist with the EPA. And she's going to give us a run through of some of her work and the work uh, related to the uh, identification of critical source areas and how they can be used to target select reap fields and, and targeting margins within, within those fields and what the information that the EPA have available to them. So thanks and I'll hand over to Jenny now. Thanks very much, Jerome. I'll just put this on to full screen now and you might confirm that you can see it. Are we good there? That's fine, Jenny. Yeah, I excellent. See you, okay. hear you. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> and uh, yes, uh, apologies to those who may have seen some of the earlier slides in this presentation before. I'm just going to give a, a very brief overview of the water quality situation and how it relates to farming. And then I'm going to focus most of the next 20 minutes or so on some new maps we've developed called the pollution impact potential maps, which will help you on farm pick out where the risky areas are for losing uh, nutrients to water courses, which is our biggest problem. So I'll make a start anyway with uh, an overview, I suppose, of our water quality situation in Ireland. And if we move to the panel on the left there, we measure water quality at uh, a number, uh, several thousand monitoring stations, and we monitor lots of different things. It's not only what's in the water in terms of nutrients and chemicals and whatever, but it's also how the aquatic ecosystems are managing in those waters. So we look at the uh, invertebrates and insects and bugs and fish uh, to see how the overall aquatic health is doing. And we measure it in, in a five class system, ranging from blue, which is high, right down to the red, which is bad. So you can see the distribution of the ecological status, as we call it, of our water courses around the country. It's quite wide, widely distributed. And about half of our rivers and uh, almost two thirds of our estuaries are unsatisfactory. So those are in the worst uh, condition overall. If we move to the middle panel then, and we look at how those five classes have changed over time. So we've seen a decline in the number of high status water bodies in the blues there. The blues are going down over time over the last decade. And the oranges uh, and the yellows have increased. So we're seeing a decline in our high status waters and an increase in the ones at the at the poorer end of the scale. So we have we have some water quality challenges, there's no doubt. Moving to the bottom panel then in the middle, this is a chart of how our, our high status waters, which are our best quality waters, have declined over time over the last three decades. And you can see we've seen a drop of just over 30% of our waters in really at the best of condition, right down to uh, just under 20% where we are now. It's not all bad news, however, and if we move to the panel on the right hand side, we are seeing a net improvement in uh, 190 priority areas for action, as they're called. And these areas for action were selected for a kind of focused effort of looking at all of the pressures, not just farming, but also uh, urban pressures and septic tank pressures and forestry, et cetera, et cetera. So a focused effort is being made currently through the River Basin Management Plan to address all of the issues in these 190 areas for action. And that includes, some of you will be familiar with the ASAP service, the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advice Programme, who are working with the local authorities' waters programme in those waters to tackle the farming issues when they arise. So we are seeing a net improvement in water quality in those 190 areas. So that's really positive. So when waters are in trouble then, what are the main difficulties that we see? Well, you can see in this bar chart here, the the greatest number of water bodies are impacted by excess nutrients. And when we have too many nutrients, and that's when I say nutrients, I mean phosphorus and nitrogen in waters, that leads to a, a growth, excess growth of algae. And you can see that in the photos there. Um, there's a, a lake photo and a river photo and an estuary photo. And too much algae then completely upsets the aquatic ecosystem, takes out the oxygen, and it, it makes for not a, a healthy aquatic ecosystem overall. So it, it's a real problem. And that is our biggest problem, too many nutrients in the water. The next bar then on the chart is the morphology. And what that refers to is the physical habitat condition. So do we have a nice mix of different habitat types in terms of faster flowing riffles, 
over stones which are oxygenated and deeper pools for fish to hide in and do we have a kind of a diverse habitat in our in our streams and lakes and estuaries so that's the next uh, biggest issue for us but there's no doubt that really particularly when it relates to farming it's uh, excess nutrients and we've been doing assessments over the last number of years on what where are the problems coming from in terms of the sectors that are contributing to those problems so if again if we look at the bar chart we see all of the different uh, pressure types along the bottom ranging from agriculture which is the biggest bar so the greatest number of water bodies that are in trouble are impacted by agriculture hydromorphology then which is this physical habitat conditions that i mentioned is the next bar and then you can see them all down along urban waste water is there domestic waste water septic tanks uh, peat extraction industry etc cetera, etc cetera. now in some ways it's really no surprise that the greatest number of water bodies is impacted by agriculture when we see that agriculture is the biggest land user across ireland so it, that, that has to be acknowledged as well but certainly that we have the greatest widespread challenges uh, in terms of numbers of farmers involved in uh, needing to make improvements on farm from a water quality perspective. So the key impacts then from farming, I mentioned already that the, the nutrients are really our biggest concern and the types of uh, farming pressures that we see in relation to phosphorus, for example, are in the top left where we get poor management of the, the especially the poorly draining soils where we can lose sediment and phosphorus into water courses in scenarios like that. The nitrogen problems then though are, are a very different scenario and I'm going to talk through this in a bit more detail in the next slide or two. Really when it comes to nitrogen, the, the most difficulties we have is where we maybe don't have optimal uh, nitrogen use and we get too much nitrogen leaching down through the soils. So we really are looking at you know good nutrient management practice as per the Green Book and trying to use as little as possible to get the best nitrogen use efficiency. In the bottom uh, two pictures then on the left, this is the sorts of impacts we see in the hydromorphology space or the physical habitat condition space where we get excess um, drainage and release of sediment and bank erosion and uh, dredging and draining and, and channelization causes a real uh, impacts to the physical habitat conditions which again doesn't make for uh, good healthy aquatic ecosystems and then on the bottom right then we are we do see a, a small number relatively speaking a small number but nevertheless uh, quite important impacts when uh, chemicals particularly herbicides and uh, veterinary products can end up in water courses and cause a problem so I'm going to focus now on the on the nutrients on the nitrogen and phosphorus. They're our biggest issue, and they behave very differently in the landscape. And that has helped us develop risk maps, which I will be coming on to in the next few slides. But first, just to give a background then on how they behave differently in the landscape. The phosphorus problems, if we focus on the left-hand side, are really most important in the poorly draining soils. They're the most difficult heavy soils and the problem arises where we get overland flow over those heavy soils, bringing sediment and phosphorus together overland into the nearest ditch or water course. These kinds of problems can happen whether or not you've got high farming intensity. So they can just as easily happen in extensive farming areas where maybe there's a uh, poor practice going on. And the types of measures that we need is about breaking that pathway between those poorly draining soils and the water course. So literally just breaking the link. And that could be, and I'll, I'll come to this again later, that could be as simple as a, a hedge or a little mound or a buffer strip or a diversion. But it's just to try and stop that overland flow, getting into the water courses and bringing the sediment and the phosphorus with it. And if we can achieve that, then the lag times between taking the action and seeing the water quality improvement can be very short. In, in the order of weeks to months just. Phosphorus is a key issue for our rivers and lakes. And so it, it, when we get too much phosphorus, that's what leads to the growth of the algae in the rivers and lakes in the freshwater systems. So moving to the right-hand side then, the nitrogen story, as I call it, is a completely different setting, a different scenario. The most risky areas for nitrogen loss are the freely draining soils. And the types of uh, measures we need are about, as I mentioned earlier, managing the leaching of nitrogen down through those freely draining soils into groundwater and then the groundwater brings it horizontally into the rivers and streams so it's a different pathway altogether 
And pathway interception measures are much more difficult in this scenario because the pathway is straight down. So it's the leaching really that we need to control here. And that means better management of our nutrient use efficiency and fertility and making sure that uh, the least amount of uh, nitrogen fertilizer is used as possible. The lag times here when we do take the action are typically a bit longer. It can be months to years, <clears throat> but it's not it's not the kind of decades of time scales that we can see in other countries. Our, our systems are a lot quicker to move nutrients and, and water through the system. So it's, it's looking at, you're looking at probably months to years to see the benefits. Nitrogen in particular is a problem for our estuaries. So it goes down into groundwater, into the rivers, and then off down to the nearest uh, estuary or coastal water. So two very different scenarios, and that means two very sets, different sets of risk maps and two very different sets of measures. We can also now to use our water quality information to see, well, where do we need these kinds of measures? Where are we having the difficulty? So this map here shows you in the blue, these are all the areas where we need phosphorus measures, these pathway measures to break the, the, the links between the poorly draining soils and the water courses. And those types of measures do also have benefits for sediment. So phosphorus and sediment kind of go together. These kinds of measures also have benefits for biodiversity. On the other hand, then, in the orangey colours, these are the areas where we have nitrogen difficulties. And particularly, we have uh, difficulties in our estuaries all along the south coast there. And those catchment areas that drain to the south are the, the catchment areas that are bringing that nitrogen. And so we need measures in these orange areas to reduce nitrogen losses in those freely draining soils. And the types of measures are about controlling the losses or the leaching. And these kinds of measures are also the same sorts of measures that we need to employ for climate and for ammonia uh, reductions as well. So we're really uh, trying to push the concept of the right measure in the right place to achieve the water quality outcomes that we need. So we've mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, we've developed a set of risk maps uh, to help you figure out when you're on farm with the farmer where the uh, most risky areas are for losing phosphorus and for losing nitrogen, given that the nutrients are our biggest problem. So this is our phosphorus risk map. It's called our pollution impact potential map. And it's really a, a map that gives you a, a sense of the relative risk of uh, impacts from phosphorus from agriculture to water courses. The darker the blue, the higher the risk. There's seven categories there. So you can see, for example, that North Kerry and West Limerick and up around Cavan Monaghan are the dark blue areas are coming through. And that's really much dictated by the poorly draining soils in those areas. In contrast to what's going on in Cork, there where a lot of it is freely draining. So the higher, the, the darker the blue, the greater the risk. I'm going to give you a couple of slides now just to show you how we've generated this uh, phosphorus pollution impact potential map. This is it blown up now at kind of farm scale. And you can see that the lighter blue lines are the water courses on the map. You can pick out the fields, which are colored up those seven colors right the way from the lighter to the dark blue. And then there's some other uh, orangey yellow lines, which are the overland flow pathways. And the red dots are the places where those overland flow pathways intersect with the water course. So I'm going to just talk through the model structure now and help understand where that, where we've, how we've derived this map and where it's come from. So we've started off with the bedrock and the subsoils information and the soils information. And all of these together tell us about how susceptible the landscape is for losing phosphorus, because as I mentioned, it's the more poorly draining settings that are the most risky for phosphorus loss. We've combined that then with the DAFM Lippis and Ames data. So we know what farming activities are going on on top of those soils. And that gives us the, the loading coming from agriculture. What's, what's the source of phosphorus like in those soils? And that's what's giving rise to the combination of both of those is giving rise to the dark blue blocks, the field blocks. And that's a field by field, parcel by parcel assessment. On top of that, then we have the delivery paths. These are the overland flow pathways that I mentioned in the in the orange and red colors. And this is how rainfall, when it falls on these soils, will make its way to the nearest stream. So we have those mapped as well. And we also have the delivery points, which are where the overland flow pathways 
intersect with the water course, which is those red dots. And the bigger the dot, the greater the, the amount of overland flow that it will make its way to the stream. So I suppose this is just to give you a sense of what that map is showing you then. So really the most risky areas on the farm are the dark blue areas where you have the overland flow pathways intersecting with the nearest ditch. So your, your large red circles are the places where you would target your interception, your pathway interception measures. What does that look like on the ground then? The photo there, there at the top right gives you a sense of it. And every farmer will know this themselves on their land. They don't really need maps to tell, <coughs> excuse me, to tell them. It's those wet areas which always are the, the last to dry out. They can often have difficulty growing uh, the most productive grass and they're, they're just wet. This is the, the most risky areas for losing phosphorus and sediment over land. And you can see then blown up again on the on the bottom map on the right there, the larger the dot, the greater the, the contribution of overland flow bringing that phosphorus and sediment into the ditch. So we know that we have about a thousand water bodies that need uh, measures for phosphorus and sediment. And that's about 60% of our water bodies that are in trouble. So it really is our biggest, most widespread uh, problem is managing these critical source areas as they're called. These maps have been developed now. They are available, and I'm going to show you at the end of the presentation where you can get them. Um, but and we can we can say using these maps now that if we if we targeted the most the highest risk uh, areas, which amounts to about 2,400 kilometers of riverbank, which is less than two percent of our riverbanks, and we put those interception measures there on those red dots, then we would achieve the best bang for our buck in terms of protecting. Uh, water courses from phosphorus and from sediment. And these tools now are in use by the ASAP program to help them start the conversation with farmers uh, when they go on, go out and, and walk the land. I should mention too that when you have a look at these maps and you, and you blow them up, those dark blue areas and the pathway interception points and the overland flow pathways, when you see those on farm, it doesn't necessarily mean that those farms are causing a problem. But what it does mean is if there is a problem, those are the places where you go and look for it. Some of those areas might be fenced already because we don't know what farm activities are going on. We don't have that level of information. So yeah, some of them may be fenced already. Some of them may, may be disconnected. Their water courses and ditches may have changed, et cetera, et cetera. So these maps are to be used as a guide, I suppose, to help your conversation uh, with the farmer when you go on in, into the fields. What sorts of measures then, when we say pathway interception measures, what do we mean? Well, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's about really trying to break that pathway and stopping the runoff and the, the sediment and the phosphorus from getting into the water courses, or at least delaying it, not stopping it completely, but delaying it sufficiently for the phosphorus and the sediment to drop out. And so the kinds of things we that, that are, are good examples of this would be riparian and buffer zones, which can be planted up with uh, native species, for the, the birds, etc. Native woodlands are always a good option. There's grant and premium going for those as well in these critical source areas. Um, engineering ditches is a new concept coming through from the UK, which is where you use the existing ditch network and essentially turn it into a series of ponds. You can see the, the, the picture on the top left there. And the purpose of those ponds is not to stop the flow because those there's connecting pipes through those bonds through the ditch. So the water still moves, by slowing it down briefly, the sediment and the phosphorus drop out, and then that can be taken out at the end of the season and uh, put back on land. And these types of measures um, do have these co-benefits for biodiversity and for pathogens as well, which is uh, an added bonus. So on now to the nitrogen risks. And I mentioned that the, the most risky areas for nitrogen are these freely draining soils, as you can see in the picture there. And this map is nearly the exact opposite of the phosphorus risk map. So you can see down in Cork, uh, for example, the darker the purple uh, colors there show the greatest risk. And this is because the freely draining soils are the highest risk for this nitrogen leaching to happen. In contrast, we'll say to Mayo and uh, West Galway, which would be higher risk for losing phosphorus. So how we generate these maps then is somewhat similar. We start off with the with the lipids data and the AIMS data and the nitrates data from DAFM. So we know what uh, agriculture loading is going on on the land. We combine that then with a Chagas leaching model. So we know how much of what goes on land actually leaches through to the groundwater. 
We then combine that with uh, susceptibility maps using Geological Survey of Ireland and EPA data layers. So again, the soils and the subsoils and bedrock, so we can see what happens to the leached nitrogen after it, it goes down. And we can pull those all together, put in some pathway attenuation factors and losses, and that together then gives us our pollution impact potential map for nitrogen. And we can use that map and also the previous uh, phosphorus pollution impact potential map and our water quality data to pull out, again, th this map I showed earlier, those areas where we need phosphorus measures and where we need nitrogen measures. So when we blow up the, the nitrogen pit map then uh, and see what that looks like at field scale, it's very different. It's the purple colors. We don't have the overland flow pathways on this because, as I mentioned, the pathway is actually straight down. It's vertical. So these are field by field uh, blocks. And the darker the purple, the higher the risk. So the two uh, small catchment examples I have there, Timaleague and Cork, which would be very high risk. Most of the, the fields in that catchment area would be high risk for nitrogen loss. And we see that reflected in the nitrogen concentration in those waters, that these two catchments are both agricultural catchment program uh, catchments, the mini catchments. So we have very high concentrations of nitrogen in the water in Timaleague. In Ballycanoe, by contrast though, we only have a very small patch of the highest risk darker darker purple areas and most of it would be low risk and that's because Ballycanoe is more a poorly draining uh, setting for any of you who have been there you'll you'll recognize that and that's reflected in the nitrogen concentrations there so we have about 500 uh, water bodies that need uh, nitrogen reduction measures and we do see that uh, excess nitrogen is starting to affect drinking water supplies as well. So we have about 18 drinking water supplies that are impacted by high nitrate and trends are, are going up in terms of nitrogen concentrations in the south and southeast, which is a concern. So we using again our PIP maps, we can map out around 7,000 square kilometers of the highest risk critical source areas, as they're called, where nitrate losses from har farms will be the highest in the south and southeast. And these can be used now to target nitrogen reduction measures, nitrogen leaching reduction measures. Again, the same caveat as with the phosphorus maps, just because a field is purple doesn't mean it is causing a problem. It just means if there's a problem, these are the highest risk areas to go and look. Again, farming practice may have changed since we did this assessment uh, and you'll have a better sense of it yourselves when you when you go on farm and, and talk to the farmers. The types of measures then we're talking about as it, you know it is really about trying to stop that nitrogen leaching. So it's nutrient management planning, soil fertility, better use uh, nitrogen use efficiency of the nitrogen that is being used, reduction of application of chemical N where possible, best use of our organic fertilizers using less and protection to urea for uh, chemical and mixed wards which, which can and, and clover which can bring in extra nitrogen into the system without having to use the, the, the chemical. Just one caveat with those, the use of less and protected urea and uh, clover can bring extra nitrogen into the system. So those are only going to give us a water quality benefit if they're offset by a reduction in chemical use at the same time overall. Otherwise there's a risk that they could just bring more nitrogen in and, and that would lead then to, to more leaching overall. So where can you find out about uh, the, low, the, the water quality in the nearest stream and also the pressures and, and find these pit maps? Well, they're available on our website, catchments.ie. You can click into the maps um, toolbar at the top there and that will bring you into a screen, a mapping system where you can see the status, the ecological status and the risks and you can pull up your pollution impact potential maps for nitrogen and phosphorus under the pressures and activities uh, button. Now, on top of that, these maps are also being um, uh, put into the GLAM system, and uh, that should hopefully be in, in the coming weeks, and then also in uh, NMP Online. So Chagas have these maps as well, and they will be available in, in NMP Online shortly as well. So three sources there for you to pull up those maps. So that's it, Jerome. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jenny. And yes, just to, just to confirm that, yes, we are in the process of the, our IT colleagues are putting these maps and they will be available on the, the REAP layer within GLAMS. So 
you'll be able to turn an off this layer at parcel level to see which which parcels are, are affected and we're prioritizing the phosphorus pips initially but we will have the nitrogen ones available as well in 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 time but the priority ones for reap from the point of view of targeting field margins etc and reap fields uh you know we're, we're, we're going with the, the phosphorus data set first because it's quite a lot of data for us to import but we, we it's important for us to have it in there so that as you see as someone has already asked in the comments you know about making this layer available and it is important that we can we can intersect it with the parcels and reap fields at ground level 